And uh, I would like to thank uh, the indigenous peoples of Southern California for inspiring me to study and learn more about the past. I'm humbled in the presence of the work that I do and the work that we do on San Nicolas Island. And sometimes I don't think I'm worthy, but I'm gonna share our experiences with you today and hopefully it fleshes out some of these stories. So let's see if we can get going here. Forward. Ah, if you don't know, San Nicolas Island is the outermost and most isolated of the Channel Islands, indicated here in the red square. To put a little context, uh, I'm going to be talking about CASNI 25, which was perhaps the last village occupied by the native people of San Nicolas Island, probably the home to uh, the lone woman's immediate ancestors, and maybe she was even born there. Uh, but to place it where the box cache feature that we're going to talk about later this afternoon, a whalebone hut that was reconstructed in the 1940s, and then Lost Indian Cave, as Steve will talk about later in this session. There are many archaeological sites in the Channel Islands, as you can see from this uh, slide right here. So far, we've recorded over 550 of them. And as you could see, erosion has probably destroyed a lot. Um, and so in some ways, I feel like we're fighting against time. Uh, in the 20 years I've been working on the Channel Islands, I've seen whole dunes you know, or half dunes collapse, where middens have been destroyed. And so I, I really feel there's an urgency to do this type of work. The site that I want to discuss to sort of uh, paint the picture of the lone woman's people is SNI 25, or also called the Thule Creek site. Many of these slides were produced by my students. I don't have anywhere near the talents they have. So I, I, you know who you are, but I won't necessarily thank you for each slide individually. <laughs> now, from the ground, you could see that CSNI 25, or the Thule Creek site, is large. It, it takes about a quarter of a mile of that, and it overlooks an incredible harbor called Corral Harbor, which is probably a very important spot for the native people. We focused on two large-scale excavations called East Locust and Mount B, but as you could see from this slide, we also uh, had the various test units that helped to inform us on how do we expand our excavations. Over, and I don't expect you to read that, but over 60 radiocarbon dates <laughs> established a chronology for the site, uh, suggesting that the first time people occupied, at least where we uh, have sampled was about four or five thousand years ago. But the majority of the materials that I'm going to use to sort of paint the portrait of the lone woman's people come from the last five or eight hundred years of occupation when it was used as a village. Like most sites in the Channel Islands, the midden there is well preserved and it has faunal remains that uh, inform us about the types of diet that the people had. And like the other sites uh, on the Channel Islands, most of the shellfish uh, come from the local intertidal zone, else, but also include echinoderms and crustaceans. Fish was very important to the lone woman's people. And we have abundant evidence that fish and fish processing occurred at this site. As you can see some, from some of the articulated fish bones we uncovered. And some of these fish include rockfish, sheephead, lingcod, many of the same species that if you fish the waters today, you'll catch these. And they provided really the staple along with other resources for the lone woman's people. Lots of evidence for circular shell fish hook making. And we have, I think, over 400 fish hooks in different stages of manufacture. But one of the interesting things that we connected to this was this sort of humble looking sandstone abrader that Malcolm Rogers in the 1920s and 30s described as a sandstone saw. We found over 100 of sandstone saws in our excavations. And if you notice, the one in the lower right hand corner has a residue. So we wanted to understand what that residue was. We wanted to get a closer look at it. So Kevin Smith and a bunch of my other students, including Bill Kendig, uh, started to apply replicative studies. And they found out that the sandstone saw was perfect for refining the making of circular shell fish hooks. Well, we're somewhat scientists, so we want to take it a step further. So we put these, uh, put the residue under a scanning electron microscope and found out it was made of calcite and aragonite, 
which are the two components of calcium carbonate that make up many shells, including abalone. So it gave us a direct link with a, a very humble looking artifact to a very important manufacturing process that again, likely provided the stable for subsistence for the lone woman's people. Monterey and Seco Chert points, metavolcanic and metasedimentary knives were used to hunt and were used to process many of the sea mammals and cetaceans that occur around the island. This is a crystal uh, point. Whether it was used for hunting, we don't know, probably not. But elephant seals, sea lions, otter, whales, porpoises, dolphins, we have bones of all of these critters at the site here. So the people uh, of this village certainly pursued everything in the marine environment. Monterey chert and few shale drills were used to make loads and loads of wonderful ornaments, including beads of, of all kinds of different shells, including detalium, clam, mussel, abalone, and of course the ubiquitous olivella shell bead industry. We have evidence that they were making them right here at the site, but the incredible thing is there's a variety of different olivella shells that we found and, and the different types of beads that were made out of them, including wall beads and also the simple spiralot bead. Ornaments from clam and this wonderful lower left abalone pearl that's incised. Sort of give us an idea of how they decorated themselves. Bone tools of sea mammal and of bird provided a very important resource for the people. And many of the birds around the island provided the raw material to make these things, including pelican, gull, and cormorants. Ground, sand, ground stone artifacts pestles and bowls we found whole and in fra and fragmented form come from the local sandstone. The island is basically made of hard sandstone and the native peoples themselves utilize that for their everyday and worldly goods. They also use the sandstone to process important plant resources including blue dick and buckwheat and prickly pear and silver lupin and, and a whole bunch of others. The vegetation provided habitat for lizards and for the island fox and for a mouse species, which we find in the middens and which we found that the people did utilize. Soapstone from Catalina and the mainland was used for utilitarian purposes to make bowls, fasteners, but also to make pendants. And it shows that the people were, were, were trading. This incredible mola mola pendant was found in our excavations. And um, if you don't know what a mola mola is or ocean sunfish, here's a photo. And you get an idea of the scale, how large this fish can be based on the diver right here. It's pretty amazing. San Nicolas Island is home of the only two effigies that were, that, that were made for, uh, to depict mola molas. This is from the Terry Collection in New York, and although we don't have a provenience for it, we do know it's from San Nicolas Island. These I didn't find, but I wanted to put it in the context of uh, how soapstone and other stone animal effigies were very important to the people. Now these are single individual artifacts that we found, and ecofacts, or, 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 or the faunal remains that we found. But to get at more of the behavior and the social activities that took place, we needed to expand our excavations. And so what I want to do is go through some of the features that we found in this expansion here. The red, bright red units are the first initial units. And from there, we expanded out and found pits that perhaps represent ceremonial feasting. The pits themselves were very organized. The space itself was very clean. And inside the pits were basically the remains of sea mammals, fish, shellfish, and other things that they ate. But that it was so clean and so organized, we believed it was part of a feasting ceremony. In the Unit 8 expansion on the northeast quadrant of East Locus, uh, we found a few features that are all contemporaneous, beginning with this double dog burial. And the double dog, as you could see how carefully laid out, you realize how important these animals were to the local people. And so it's no surprise that dogs are such an important part of this session, but
but we're sort of an important part of the native Nicolaino in the past. Associated with this was a pestle feature. And the pestle feature itself made of sandstone with a granite cap. But look at the ochre. Ochre was very important to the people for a variety of purposes. This stacked stone rock feature, the radiocarbon dates, they're, again, they're all sort of associated uh, and related to one another. If you break it apart, it looks like this. Sandstone, likely from the island. A basalt brescia, perhaps from the island or traded in. And serpentinite, either from the mainland or Catalina Island. A donut stone or a digging weight or a net weight was found. Calcite crystals, there's lots of calcite on the island, and this redwood stick, all associated with the double dog burial. Toshiwat stones were also found. Now, Toshiwat stones were used by, by shamans for rainmaking ceremonies or for curing ceremonies, were very important. And the home place, the origin of Toshiwat stones, San Nicolas Island. Hematite or ochre was spread all across the, the, the locust, but tended to concentrate in areas where we find important features. Now, ochre could be found on the island today, and we have outcrops that represent bright, bright red to peach to orange color, but it's readily available. Now, from the northeast quadrant of the locust, I want to take us to the southwest quadrant and introduce a triple dog burial and some of the associated features found with that. If we look at a plan view of all the features of East Locust, and we, on the far north, that's the double dog burial in the upper right hand corner, and it's associated hearth in the middle there with a pit. All the radiocarbon dates are contemporaneous in this, in this case. And now if we look at the triple dog burial over here, it also has its associated hearth and pits. And we first encountered the triple dog burial, well, let's go over here. Here you can see the fire hearths in a row and the pits and their radiocarbon dates. And an idea how large some of these pits are. Now, Rachel isn't the biggest person in the world, but it was about a meter wide and again, surrounded by clean white sand, showing how organized and how people took care of this place. Our first sort of uh, find, and the triple dog burial was in 2007, when we found this dog, and the radiocarbon date is on a direct date from the bone itself. And then in 2009, when we came back, we found these two associated with it. And the radio, look at the radiocarbon dates. We know from these radiocarbon dates that these three dogs were put down, perhaps sacrificed, but were put down perhaps in one day, or one evening, or one ceremony. Disarticulated dog bone clusters were found surrounding the triple dog burial and were found with whale bone, asphaltum, tarring pebbles, and other things. Now, when we break this all apart, and this is the important part for me, we look at all the features at SNI 25, and then we examine the Shignishnish, which was the religion of the local area. And many historians believe that the Shignishnish religion was introduced after Europeans came to the region. But when we begin to look at all of the things, ceremonial ground, check. Sacrifices and offerings, check. Organized space, religious paraphernalia, it's all there. But before Europeans entered or before they began to settle the area. And so when we begin to examine who these people were, what languages they spoke, it's likely that the people of San Nicolas Island spoke uto aztecan languages, uh, related to the Luiseño, related to the Juaneño, and the Serrano, and others. And it, it's likely that the people of San Nicolas Island, or the lone woman's people, also shared these linguist, this linguistic heritage. Now, to put it in broader perspective, these important, this important five-volume set by Hudson and Blackburn look at the sort of the material culture of the Chumash interaction sphere. But when you break it apart, most of the stuff come from San Nicolas Island. And this is just by comparing what's counting the different artifacts in those volumes, 435 from San Nicolas Island. To me, this highlights, it shows how important the people of San Nicolas Island were and how connected they were to the regional economy. Take it a step further, follow the red, 
and the red represents sand nickel silent. For every volume, sand nickel silent dominates. So, if we were to paint a portrait of the lone woman's people, what could we say? We could say they not only relied on the marine environment, but certainly the terrestrial environment as well, but they incorporated into their not only everyday lives, but their spiritual lives and their worldview. And to us, this is what makes this story so exciting. You can go from faunal remains to dog burials to the people themselves. And that's what we're trying to do as archaeologists, ultimately bring it back to the people. And that's why we're here today. Thank you.